You know? Not with shotgun. With love. Love drive by. That means only what does it mean? It means say hello. Like that. Say hello, that means a lot. When you speak to the spirits, the gods, Utsa Chi Utsa Wacha. Does your face sit well on your ancestors' trunk, Father? That's what we say to the sun when it comes out in the morning. Even the, even the gods have ancestors. And they have to feed their ancestors. They're hard at work with that. So you've got to say hello. You see a young kid like this. Hello. Hello the first. I mean, there were some guys in Los Angeles. They were very wealthy lawyers. And they're sitting around how to help the young gang kids. And they're telling them this and saying that, and we're going to make a youth center, we're going to spend a lot of money doing this, a lot of money doing that. I said, well, that's good. So what would you do, Martin? I said, well, do you know any of these kids? He says, no. I said, well, okay, there are eight of you. So you can only deal with eight kids, or maybe four, or maybe three among you. Because for every gang kid, you're going to take four of you adults. So you go down into the neighborhood and shake hand with one. Just pick one. Well, what's that going to do? So we'll do it, and you'll see. So only one guy had the guts to do it. The rest of them just wanted to throw money at something and stay at home safe. And so the one guy did it, though. The one guy did it. I won't mention his name because in honor of the other ones, they did it. You understand? So he went down and he shook hands with one kid. And the kid said, what the hell do you want with me? Well, he could have knew him from a conference, you know. What do you want with me? So I just came here to say hello. Because he knew what street corner would be on there because he knew he'd be there every day at 4 anyway. That's his corner. He says, well, I just came to say hello. He said, you drove all the way over here? You don't want to sell me something or get me something or get me in trouble? He said, no, I just came to say hello. Oh, all right. So the guy takes off, and that's it. Two days later, he comes back. Same kid sitting in the same corner. He says, uh-oh. Here comes Whitey, man. Come to shake my hand. I shake his hand again. So where do you come? I said, I came to shake your hand. I said, hello. How you been? He said, ah, well, I got this problem with so-and-so, and this is going on. And pretty soon his homies show up, and at four or five. He said, what do you want, my man? Well, uh, I just came to say hello, but I'll say hello to you guys, too. You know, how are you doing, honey? I'm so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, what's your name? And, of course, they give you a fake name because anybody in the tribe will never give you their real name. <laughs> My name's not Martin. Honestly, it's not. My name is not Martin. But now I'm going to tell you my real name so you know that I trust you. I'm no better than the kids in the street. In fact, I'm much worse, much worse. I've been shot at many more times, and I had more of my friends killed than they have. All right? Dragged out from under me. I've been cheated out of my village many times. I'm not there. I'm here talking to you guys. Talking with you guys, getting your generous hearts to refuel and give something back that I can to keep it alive. My real name is Sip Sanun. That means hummingbird made out of smoke. That's my name. Sip Sanun. So you know I trust you now. So I don't tell nobody that name unless I like them or I trust them. That's my real name. So you go talk to the homies, you know. When they start telling you their real name, then you take them to coffee. Show up in two days later, go to coffee. Of course, you're going to have 19,000 guys with you going to coffee. <laughs> because once they realize that there's a meal in this, a lot of guys are going to show up. And that's known as a man's conference. <laughs> All right? And that doesn't take any money. It doesn't take any money. It just take a big heart and some courage. And so oh, once the youth sees that he's being seen, he'll run every con he can on you to test if you're real. He isn't going to go there, oh, yes, what a nice man coming over here. I said, can we get his wallet? You know? It's like, <laughs> well, I shouldn't tell that joke. Okay, I won't tell it. But uh, you know, when they're done doing all those cons to test if you're real, You'll never be able to shake them off your back. Be like a flea and a horse. You'll be able to buck them off. And like these young, beautiful young men that are here singing, blessing you, right now you feel like almost insulted by the fact that you have been out potlatched. You've been out, you, they outgifted you. They outdid you. They did you all to hell. And that's what's wonderful. Because the whole idea that we're supposed to talk about tonight is called mutual indebtedness. And I told you this story last year. Remember when I told you about being a chief and about trying to pay everybody back? How many of you guys remember that story? All right, bunch of them. Well, this whole idea is that is to create a village. It means that everybody is indebted to everybody else. The idea of corporation is that nobody that you get out of the you know out of debt and that you stay in a profit zone. The Mayans are always trying to stay in debt. That's why the World Trade Organization doesn't like them. 
<laughs> they sent social anthropologists to our village to figure out what do we do with these people. They keep giving all their stuff to each other. They don't hate each other. They won't compete. Well, that's the only way they survive for millennia. Otherwise, they would have died. So that's what's happening with us now. The thing is, is that when you, human ingenuity, human creativity, human expressiveness is what kept you people alive for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of centuries. The person who had the ingenuity to do this, or to lift that, or chip this rock, or do things this way, the one who thought of something to do like that, ingenuity was become all of a sudden the way that you make life live. Creativity and distribution amongst one another is the only way you can make it from one end to the next. There's no way the men and women can make it unless that happened. In the individualism that was not dedicated to making everything better for everything, ended up with the, the individual would end up dead. Not the tribe, the individual. Now you can have the individualism all you want, and that's a wonderful thing, that freedom of being yourself. But what do we do with it? Well, we throw ourselves away and we throw our youth away because what happens then is that in order to mate with a woman, in order to have a girlfriend, she, de she doesn't demand your grandfather's songs from you anymore. She doesn't demand your ingenuity anymore. The, the spirit of the earth doesn't demand that from the people. What is being demanded now is that they be flat and they look like everybody else and they act like everybody else and therefore you can get this and you can get that. But then what do you got? Because you have sold everything off that was really you, that was your edge, in order to get one little thing that you really never get anyway. Your true bride is your own soul. That woman that wants to live with you is a wonderful human being. But your true bride is your own soul. Salvador Dali, I, I had the honor of meeting this knucklehead when I was about, I think I was 18. I drove a car, I didn't have this crazy life I live, you know. I said, when I was 18, I got a job as a chauffeur, driving a car for a Navajo painter, <laughs> who happened to be a gay guy. He was a very famous painter named R.C. Gorman, Richard Carl Gorman. A very famous painter. And he's a crazy Navajo guy, you know. And, um, and well, uh, you know, I'm raised with Indians, so he said, you drive my car for me. Well, he knows Salvador Dali. And so I meet him, and Salvador Dali says, when you're 14, you fall in love with everything. You're supposed to fall in love with the earth. You see the world out there, and it's just like a big woman, and every woman you sleep with is that earth. And the Indians believe that. Like when you make love with a woman from your village, you're making love with the whole goddamn village. And the child that comes out of there is the union between you and the earth itself. And so that child is called the sunlight. Every child in the village, literally, when you present them, say, this is my first sunlight, this is my first dawn light. So you have an erotic relationship with the landscape. And dig that. And Salvador Dali he said to me, he said, that's how it is. So your wife becomes your mistress. So, so your creativity and your art become your wife. And the woman that's with you is your forbidden lover. Who needs another one? You already have a forbidden lover. And your real one is the one that you carry on your back that has to be matured by initiation. You have to go to the underworld because the gods steal her away every year. They get lonesome for her, you know. They get lonesome for the soul of the earth and they come and they steal her away. And they take her down and the earth dries up and it gets all dry and there's no more rain and no more snow. And the youth have to go to the underworld and bring her back. And they do. And when they do, everybody's happy and they're happy about it. Like these kids came in, everybody's happy. The youth returned with their souls on their backs, which are their brides, which is the, collectively the whole bride of the village. You understand what I'm saying? Is this too crazy? Okay. So they're coming back with the bride of the whole village. And when she returns, as each one of their individual souls flowering on their back, literally the orchids on their backs are flowering. And they look like big flower, this character. And they come in there shaking like this. You know, they've gone 60 miles without food and water. You know, trying to bring this thing back that they have to mature. It's the kind of fruit things that's inside this bundle. They're not even allowed to look in for three days. And they have to mature. And they normally mature in two weeks. Three days they do it. Nobody knows how it happened magically. And it comes out and they hold it up from the village. All the old men showed it at me cheered. They said, their soul has been cooked, they say. The bride has been returned to the village. And it begins to rain. And the earth comes back alive. It was the youth that bring the village back to life. The human being has to be reinvented every single year. It's not like a Western society. Oh, once we figured out how this is, now we go on to the next problem. Not with us. We go back to the old problem. Because it comes back every year. Your depression will come back every year if you don't do that. 
You have to reinvent life every single year with a ritual. And that's what ritual is about. It's reinventing the human being every single year. While the young men are getting initiated, the little bit older guys, not the old guys, the little bit guys kind of like 35 years old become sub-chiefs and they're initiating the youth. The little bit older guys are initiating the guys that are initiating the youth. And the really, really old guys are initiating the guys that are initiating the guys that are initiating the youth. Everyone's getting staggered up a step. You dig what I mean? So now when, when there's a, a, a young man getting initiated, the man initiating him is getting initiated. And the man that's helping him is getting initiated. So when you ask me, what do we do if we haven't been initiated and we can't find nobody that's initiated? Well, that's not, not the point. The point is, are there anyone among you who are willing to not be initiated in order that the youth can be initiated? Therefore, your sacrifice will have been a blessing that will be seen by the Spirit as a great gift, a wonderful gift. But how many have it within them to say, I will truly do that? Because, you know, it's kind of an oxymoron in a way, because as soon as you have the maturity to say, I'm going to stand aside and not whine for milk and become the milk, you're already acting like an initiated person. <laughs> you know what I mean? So what can you do? He has to laugh and walk a little crooked and be like an old man. Like a friend here says, you're walking in balance. And I says, no, I'm walking balanced. I'm walking like old man today. That's to us balanced. Because the other side of me you can't see. And that's perfect balance with it. That's why old guys, they walk crooked, because they're more balanced, because their spirit side is now walking like that, and they walk like this. See what I mean? When I walk straight like this, the other side, is, you're carrying it along, you know, because you're young and tough, you know. And when you go, oh, you, you get loose, and you walk like crooked, because the other side is walking in an equal way with you to balance out. You've got the ACDC current. <laughs> the electrodes are flashing back and forth. I'm learning these things, you know. Getting modernistic. So, once again, some of you have asked me to say, who is this character, Martin? And why does he keep talking about this? And why did he leave Guatemala? The reason he left Guatemala is because of $5,000 price on my head. And it's not only on my head, it's on my kid's head and on my family's head. They want to kill me. All right? So I live here. All right? Barely escape with my life. You'll have to read the second book to hear about how I left. you read the first book, Why I Left. It's just a tearful journey for me to recount to you. And a very, very, very hard thing for me to have written this book about something that was so beautiful that I can no longer have, and that so many of our people can no longer have. Because within the last five years, all the initiations in our village have been suspended. We don't have them anymore. Okay? It's not your fault. It's not their fault. It's the fault of the same thing is the reason you don't have. The same reason you don't have it, the same reason they don't have it. Not because you guys did something. It's the same soul inside belonging for it, yeah? Same soul belonging for it, you know? To be together. Ha! And that longing is what's going to save your ass. It's going to save all of us. That longing for it is what's going to save it. Not to throw that away. Not to drink liquor to get that pain away. Not to take dope to get that pain away. Not to watch TV to get that pain away. Not to watch a movie to get the pain away. You know, not to try to get a woman to make you feel some way to get that pain away. To be with that pain, to be with that debt you feel in your belly this very moment toward those young men that were sitting up here. To not be jealous of them. Not to steal from the youth. Don't steal from them. Give them gifts and don't be conned. It has to be real. Because the youth have already learned to be like us. We're good conners. Otherwise, how do we survive, yeah? We're deceptive beings. That's how we lived. So this thing's coming up, you know, our village, you know, we have so many good things and there's still a lot of good things, but the initiations are gone, the satellite dishes have come, the doors on the houses are there, the grates on the houses are in, we have violence, we have drug addiction, we have gangs, we have everything you got. We've inherited all. We've got it all at our village. All of it. 1994, there were young men killing people in our village. They were orphans from the war. They had no parents. The army came in, gave them guns, said, we don't like so-and-so, so you kill them, we'll give you this much cocaine. So they kill, bam, 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 smoke so-and-so, they give them the cocaine, they stay high, they need to get high again, they give them more cocaine, smoke so-and-so, bam, 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 bam. Then it starts getting the whole ruckus going. So what happened? The women found out who it was, and they brought them in the middle of the village, and they beat 30 of them to a pulp, and took three of them, and dismembered them, and killed them, and threw them in the lake. Now we have women who are no longer village women, because they've killed their own people. 
never happened in our history. Where did this come from? This terrible thing. It's here, it's everywhere. You're looking for me to tell you there's a Shangri-La, there's a Eden, you can leave here and buy a ticket, go to Guatemala and go to my village and get all this shit. No way in hell, that's already killed. I was there when I was still alive, that's why I'm bringing you the message. I'm not sitting here saying, I'm Mr. Martin, I got all the answers, nothing like that. I've been made every mistake you made, probably, and made a lot of them that you wouldn't even have imagined. And so I teach from a point of failure. I don't teach from success. I teach from a point of failure, a point of mistake making. So my young boys, they can get no initiation. Because the father can't initiate his sons and the village can't do it anymore. Where the hell do I go for my boys? I go to you. I go to you, and that's where I have gone. It's to the men's group's men. Literally speaking, some of you were in Atlanta last week, or last month, I guess it was, and you saw a man there. His name is Orlan Bishop. He's a very fine African man. Well, he's actually from Guyana. He's half, actually, his, uh, his, uh, his mother is from India, and his father is African. And then he lives in L.A., and he works with young, troubled youth, so-called gang youth. He worked with my son, Santiago, whose godfather is Bob Roberts. All right? And he saved my son's life. And I met Orlin, Sir Robert Bly, and all this guy. That's where I met him. So there where you have it. In a nutshell, more complicated than that, you know, but I'm just telling you where it's at. So the initiations and all the things you're looking for, they see in your bones. And it's in your neighbors. And it's in your lives. And you, see, you think about all the truck driver out there that are not thinking about this, and you're thinking about the guys at the gas pumps who are not into this, and the guys at the banks and down at the business and at the work, and all the neighborhoods where you live and they're not into this and they don't understand what the hell we're talking about here. Don't count on it, because if they don't understand it, there'll be nothing left to understand, because that's what's going on. Because if there's no initiations and there's no talk about this, then there ain't going to be no people to talk about it, so don't worry. So eloquence. Somebody asked me about eloquence. They said, what is this eloquence you're talking about? <laughs> I don't know anything about eloquence. I'm just a plumber in the land of leeks, you know? <laughs> what do I know about eloquence? I'm just a poor surveyor of the soul, and I always mismeasure. I know nothing about eloquence. What do I know about eloquence? I'm just a poor refugee from the land of eloquence who are trying to spray some words and devastate your hearts with beauty. And people say, oh, you wear wild clothes. That's not wild clothes. This is to inspire the nature. Because you see, you have your own nature. And the only place you're going to find your own nature is in relation to nature. See, your own nature is in there. Your nature don't live in your mind. You don't live in your head. You live in this, you know. You live in the output of who you are. Like when I walk into Safeway, they push the red buzzer, call 911. <laughs> And I make good friends with the police, and we have a good time. There's no problem. I get my food. Sometimes they give it to you for free after that. <laughs> yeah. You never know. But you have to have courage to be yourself. So the point is, how can you be yourself unless you have a tribe? Because how do you know who you are other than how you relate to everything around you, yeah? Well, here you are. Here you are. This is you. You're the one. You're right here. So that magnificent nature that you have inside may be like a jaguar. Maybe it's like a tree or like him. Maybe it's like a wind. Or maybe it's like a squirrel, or maybe it's like a water bug, or maybe it's like a whirlpool, or maybe it's like a lightning, or maybe it's like some crashing thunder. Or then again, maybe like my teacher, whose spirit was sand. My teacher's spirit was no damn jaguar or eagle or something like that. It was sand. You know, the most magnificent sand in the world. This man I miss, and I'm pissed off at him for leaving me with a job. I'm catching him in the other world. When I get there, I'm going to have a, a real sit down, smoke some cigar with him, and talk him about it. So I miss him. I miss him, because this old man, when I felt bad as a young man, phew, I would get like any young man, and this or that would be bugging me. I'd go up to his hut, which was huge, like this place, and he would be in the dark, and I couldn't see him. I said, where is the old man? You could smell the tobacco smoke, you know? He always smoked cigar, but inside a pipe, and the cigars go in the pipe. Mayans invented these, by the way. And in the dark, you would see this glow. You just see this little spark of fire glowing in the dark, and you know the old man was sitting over there. And so you go over there, and you just sit down beside him. You rub your shoulder with him, and he give you a cigar, and you sit there. He will say one word to you. 
start smoking. And you could tell he was looking at you. You couldn't even see him. It was so dark in there. And pretty soon you start laughing or you start weeping, and we do it together. And you talk about weeping. After every feast, everybody weeps for dessert. That's what we do in the village. People think they're crazy, you know, white people, they come in and say, how come everybody's weeping? I say, well, that's what you have to do. How can you possibly eat food without weeping? It's impossible not to eat food without weeping. All that food is dyed to feed your people. And then you realize the strange dilemma of being alive when you get killed this way or you get killed that way. Whether the food gets killed and is denied of its genetic future to feed your children and yourself. Or it gets killed by having to be planted and changing form and growing painfully like we do into the forms we are now. How can you not weep? You've got to weep. And so everybody weeps because they know that's dessert. Dessert is weeping. So you eat the food and then everybody cries for being human, for being angry, for being here, for being there. And they weep and then they're done and then they laugh. And then they start dancing. And then they sing. And that's called heaven to us. When they walk the village streets after the massacre in 91, <laughs> they just kill all their people, man. I tell you, they wipe them out, you know. They shot them down. They fired an open crowd of 4,000 people. Killed 70 people, 12 children. I was present at their birth. And of all the maimed ones, the bullets through this and bullets through that, and someone came to walk, some were paraplegic, some died later. Walked through the village. What did I hear in the village the next morning? You know what that sound means in the village? How many of you have been to Guatemala? How many of you know what that means? It's the women slapping our tortillas, yeah. throwing them on the griddle, laughing, making jokes, weeping. People mourning, weeping, men going off for of firewood. The village goes on. The village was not killed by that. My sister-in-law gave birth that night from fright. Birth to a little girl. And then I checked around the village, and there was the exact same amount of births as there had been people killed. <laughs> Instantly, the village was repopulated. And the people laughing. Oh, I was crying so hard. I said, even I hear a person arguing makes me happy. You guys are the luckiest people in the bloody world. You're the luckiest people in the world. Not because you have America, not because you've got a good house and car and all that shit. Because you have time to be here in a group like this, to weep together, to sing together, to feel together, to argue together. Whatever you got to do together, you know, or discuss and disagree. You have that wonderful magnificence. We're here together to do this thing together. That's lucky. And those that don't want to be together, we don't forget them and we don't abandon them and we don't make them in the, in, invisible. They have time to be alienated together. <laughs> Even that is a blessing for us, where we come. The most horrible thing we can imagine is dying and going to a cold place by ourselves, to be alone. You know, you have Christian hell, the tar bucket, you know, where you go down there and sit with all your friends and burn. Well, you're not lonesome. Go all your buds. <laughs> My in hell is being all alone in a cold place forever. They didn't even want to imagine, they don't even tell their kids about that because it doesn't exist to them, but they just, that concept is destructive to the soul. To be alone. Who? Because in nature you're not alone. Your nature relates to all the nature around there. So everybody in the village has a soul. It's like a corn, like a hawk, like this. It's a whole ecosystem. Here you've got a whole ecosystem, you've got a whole rainforest in here. If you, each one of you sang your song, <laughs> the whole world would come alive, right? And you're out in the bush, you're not alone. So that's what I'm telling you. I know it's a lot to take in, and I know I'm giving you the hard words, but that's what I'm talking from. You know, I could give you a long story like I did last night, or I could tell you my life story, but there would be an ego trip, you know? I don't have to tell you that. I did a lot of amazing things, a lot of good things, but I, I'm more happy to be with you here now making this story now, because now this is a story. Um, this is the speech of the Spirit. The Spirit is speaking. Every time we move our leg, every time we breathe, the Spirit is telling a word. Every stone is a word. Every tree is a word. Every breeze is a word. Everything is a word. So down the village, we have a word we use, which I'm giving to you, which I give to everybody. It's called Kishkanatasha. Can you say this word? Kishkanatasha. Okay. Who remember what this word means? You know what it means, Bob. What's it mean? Do you remember? It's a real simple. It means... I remember you, remembering us, remembering you. We say it every time we meet and every time we eat. I remember you, spirits, all of the spirits that give us life, remembering us. 
I remember all these spirits remembering us, remembering you. It's a loop. And when you make a song, the back and forth dialogue. You give a gift to them, they're giving a gift to you. You give a gift to them, they're giving a gift to you. You give a gift to them, they're giving a gift to you. You give a gift to them, they're giving a gift to you. Just this pulse. So you're not alone. That's called mutual indebtedness. Only one half of you is here today. The other half is in the other side of the spirit, and you have to feed it. And your ancestors have to be fed. Everything has to be fed. If you feed it, it feeds you back. And it tries to outdo you like these kids. These young men were here, they give you a big gift and you're like, oh, we have to outdo that. And they're not going to let you tonight. They're holding out on you. They're raising the stakes much higher than they were so that you have to outdo them tomorrow. And if you won't, then we'll have to carry you for it. Because we won't say, we won't shame you. We won't say, you didn't do it. We won't say that. We say, oh, well, we'll make a gift on, on account of that one and we'll give it. Because the Indians say, if they won't carry the sun, we'll carry it. Because otherwise there'd be no life. Someday maybe they'll help us. That's how we do it. We don't blame nobody. Ah, oh, just one do that, we'll do it. Yes, it's fine. I'm not gonna get pissed about it. What's the use? Otherwise don't wanna be here. Right? Am I boring you to death? No. no. Or just a little bit, yeah? No, no, no. Okay. No. I don't wanna put you to sleep with my crazy rap. They got me wrapped up or huh? Oh, that. The bargain. Uh, we call it the bargain. There's a bargain that happens. We're talking about you know, psychology. This is Mayan psychology. All right? Mayan version of psychology goes like this. When you marry a woman, the earth hates you. The earth hates your guts. Nature hates your guts. Because your mother, when you were born, is nature. Your mother is nature. You suckle off her wonderful full breasts and you feel good. They're spinning, it's going, you're down by the fire, it should protect you from death. Oh, maybe even from your father's anger, who knows what. But anyway, you sat in her belly for a long time. I mean, God willing, you sat in there for nine months. So when you come out, you're indebted to the earth. And, but the earth doesn't call on you for any, any payment when you're little. The adults are paying for you. And then you come to be an age to be married, or you start noticing young ladies, that's when the old people call you to be initiated. So when you haul off a girl, when she hauls you off, what happens is that you all of a sudden change from being a suckler to being a provider. To bring one that's bringing the meat to the house, the one who's providing the, the food that makes the milk for your children. So what you have to do is you, now you have to steal from nature in order to provide for her. So right now you're robbing your mother. So first of all, you're suckling your mother because she wants you to be suckled. She gave birth to you. But then when you grow up and start to get married, then all of a sudden you have to rob your mom to feed your wife. And she and nature hates your guts. And that's the whole thing with the story with Robert's story there. With the, 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 the grudge that the female has against you for looking at the other woman. Okay? So what do you do with that? So that's where initiation in ritual comes in. And so the man, he has to go through this way of giving the gift back to the original mother that made his mother and made his grandmother and made his father and made his grandfather. He has to give a gift back to them. And you're, the price, what is the price for that? What's the price and the ultimate for that? No, that's the gift. That's what you get out of it. No, the price is your death. That's your rent. Death is your rent to nature for being allowed to live. De yeah, that's right. Death is the debt payment, the final debt payment. You wouldn't even be allowed to live one day if you didn't give something back some other way. But you give as much back as you can as you go to get each footstep, to get each footstep, to get each footstep. The youth are pissed at you for making this bargain without their permission. So when they turn 13, 14, it says, I didn't make any agreement with them. So why are you making me work and why are you making me do these things? And then when they have children, they say, oh, I see. <laughs> but they can't be expected to understand that. That's why they have to be under your shade and you just have to take these knocks and rocks and listen and get them through it. Until they realize that that huge triangle bargain that Robert Bly is talking about has been present and accounted for. So as long as modern culture continues 
to marry the earth to technology, it's stealing from his original mother, and the mother gets angrier and angrier and angrier. And that spirit mother has now got teeth made of atom bombs. She's got, now got teeth made of diseases you can't cure. She now has teeth made of things that kill the people who make them. That's her teeth now. Everybody says, oh, that's us humans made that. Oh, no, that's the earth getting ready to eat because it's pissed off. It changes form. It's like Beauty and the Beast. As soon as you kiss it, it turns into this prince, right? But until you can't kiss it. So you're always looking at the enemy. So what do you do? Do you develop Prozac and, and Valiums and all kinds of things to shield yourself? You find all kinds of more technological remedies for the problem in the first place. And so these remedies become part of the problem. So the remedies, technological remedies, become more indebted create a bigger and bigger debt so that the teeth grow on this angry mother. So you have married the machines, and these machines are now full of teeth, and they become the teeth. All right, so they say, well, what do we do, what do we do? No, the one that's yelling, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do, is the adolescent. The one that sits there and says, we have a dilemma, and this is what we have, and sits with that debt in the belly, will come up with a solution, and the solution is being together and giving a gift back to this thing. So that when you marry, you realize you become a thief in order to, to live. Because old time people, they had to steal from nature. And we do too. And so when you give the gift finally, then the, the mother says, oh, what a beautiful daughter-in-law I have. And she starts helping you instead of hindering you. And that's the three-way bargain. That's why all young men in our village are terrified of the female, of being devoured. You've all heard the story of the tooth mother who has uh, teeth in her vagina. You've heard of that story, right? Yeah. You guys didn't know about that? Oh, poor deprived children, I'm telling you. All right. You know that all the ancient women had big old shark-like teeth in their vaginas, right? In the old days, no women had a vagina nice and soft like they have now that you all desire right now because you've been here for two days, right? <laughs> and those days, there's a great funny saying. It said, when that woman said she wanted to have you for dinner, she wasn't kidding. <laughs> She'd chop your, your penis off. She'd eat you up. So we had a magician that came in and he put a mortar and pestle in there. He says, don't worry. And he put a big old uh, grinding stone in there and his teeth hit that thing. And you put in another one. Put in another one. And put in another one. Finally they got dull. They left one in there. It's called the clitoris. The dull tooth. As I said, it's knock the edge off the desire. Because desire, when it gets unrequited, it goes up into the head and makes wars. Same in men. So it always wants to eat you. Right? So all the young men are terrified of falling in that womb and getting devoured. All the African men in Africa, all native people, they're terrified of the woman in the first sexual encounter because they think they're going to get eaten. And very smart. So when they get initiated, that's the way of knocking the teeth out of there for the young women and making the man so he's strong enough to do so. And so then the three-way bargain is completed so that he can make love with a new woman and now he becomes a man instead of a boy because he is the one that is fulfilling the bargain understanding that he must die as a fulfillment of the payment of this blessing of being alive, but he will give other life and teach it how to do the same so that it won't die in the future. I know that's a little complicated, but it's really, that's how it works with us. So you can't just be going along and say, well, it'd be nice to just be a guy that watches TV and go along and get what I want. I want what I want, and I got what I want, and I can get it and get me a power workshop, you know, so I give her, yeah, go ahead. The earth still freezes and still fries, and you're still not immune to what goes down. So anyway... You got any other questions? I mean, so therefore, you feel that uh, everybody now is uh, more and more afraid of the earth because they haven't paid their back. Yeah, they're, they're born looking over the shoulder. What? Everyone's born looking over their shoulder. What's going to eat me? So they built bigger castles, better wars and better machines to keep themselves from getting hurt. And all they do is make the earth more angry, more and more angry. And the one that has the courage to go out gets eaten too, just like in your story. The one that goes out says, like the new age person that says, well, I'm just going to go up to this sacred place and I'm going to do the ceremony. Bam! Lightning hit him. They get run over by train. Because the, that's not the answer. That's not the answer the old lady is asking. The old lady is asking for your eloquence, for your dance. That's why Robert Bly is still alive, because he has the dance. You know how to dance with the giant. As a matter of fact, you have a poem like that. Not to get eaten. But to speak, it's not just flirtation and it's not just trickery. It's the honest to God truth. And when that thing, the spirit sees that courage with that eloquence, it's like you when you see these young men doing that. He's like, man, I don't want to eat him. And if you do want to eat him, you have to go through me because I will protect him. Honest to God, I will. And if you know me well, you know I will too. 
I'd rather die than let them hurt you. To steal from them, you can steal from them. And that's how nature is too. Once it sees your elegance and your eloquence and your dance, it says, what amazing little puny individual with a beautiful shining flower face. How amazing. Let's give it some water and let it live. And they let it live. It's a mysterious thing. How the spirit can be so generous and be so tough at the same time. See, it's very hard for people to think of a God that doesn't like people. And the minds only have one God that does like people. Everything else thinks we're an acquired taste. <laughs> I still want to go back to that anger that people, that people feel the earth have towards us now. Do you think the flight into the computer is a part of to try to uh, ignore that anger? Uh, I don't think it's uh, to ignore the anger. I think it's part of the anger of the earth. I think that we, we always think that we make those machines. I don't think we made those machines. I think the angry mother made those machines. She made them to destroy us. So there's a lot of Indians, they say to me, don't go around helping these guys. Don't help them. They're already doing themselves in. Let them die. That's the curse that we put on them a long time ago. Let them go. It's finally going to eat them all. I said, but it's going to eat you too, Jack. So we're in it together. So don't be giving me none of this racist crap. That's what I tell you. know, you got fundamentalist Indians too, you know. <laughs> I'm telling you. They all got born again Indian. You know, we got that too. Yeah, sure. And that's, I mean, all Indians are like that. Don't get me wrong. But there's a resentment of people that do understand this principle. Saying that, oh yeah, all the little inventions that they're all making. Yeah, well, we got to go help them so they don't kill them. So I said, no, let them go, let them go. Don't be part of it. Let them go, let them go. And then when they all filtered off, then the buffaloes will come back and the deers will come back. I said, no, it ain't going to be like that. And, you know, 2012 ain't going to be like that. That's what it's about. So this, this computer is trying to make everything into a, a thin thing, to something thin. Because the more thin it is, the more you can contain it and the more you can control it. And then you have this illusion that the whole world is in front of your eyes. Well, you know more than 99% of the world is not in front of your eyes. It's to the side, on top, underneath, inside, in the back, and all kinds of other places. It doesn't sit in front of you. It doesn't obey you. The earth will not obey you. You have to learn to dance with all those things. And that's what young initiated Apaches had to do. Young initiated Pueblo men. Young initiated Maasai. Young initiated Mayans. Young initiated Celts. Young initiated Scots. Young initiated uh, uh, Vikings. And young initiated Jewish men. And young initiated African men. All over the world. They all have to learn to da dance with nature. And to understand it's incredibly big and unsentimental nature. It's extremely beautiful, but it's not all just for humans. The humans are part of the beauty. They are not the reason for its beauty. We are like an earring on the earth, they call it. An earring on the earth. We enhance what already exists here. And when we cease to enhance it, then the earth says, Oh, who needs an earring anyway? That's why they call it Mayans. They call it a human being, earring of the earth. The shamans. The regular people call us 20s. Number 20, you know, like I talked about last night. But, the, but the, the shamans, they call us earrings. It's a female one and a male one. And we enhance the beauty of what already exists here. And then when we, we quit doing that, then we're a liability. We're infecting it. So this angry earth has got to be given a gift. But you can't just walk up to this angry. Say, for instance, say you've got a wolf, you know? And the wolf hasn't been fed for two months. And he's barely hanging up. <laughs> like that, and you come over there with a steak, what's going to happen? It's going to take your arm off with the steak. Not because it don't like you, but it just can, it's blinded by its hunger. It cannot distinguish between the gift and the giver. So the shaman, what he does is, says, oh, hungry wolf, oh, I see, I see, I see. And he throws little bits of meat far away. And after two or three weeks of that, the wolf is getting fatter and starting to see good again. And so, oh, there's a man. And the meat is, is that other stuff. Oh, okay. And he's the one that's been giving it to me. Oh, I'm happy about my relation with this guy. So that's how you get a relationship with the spirit. When you first, you know how afraid you are, most of you, probably about getting a relationship with spirit because it's like spooky or taboo because you've been raised some other way or because, oh, maybe it doesn't like me because you're born with that innate instinctual, like Robert says, understanding that that thing is piss off at your ass, man, for forgetting it for so many centuries. And you know that when you go in there to give it a little food, it's probably going to eat you, like that thing in the story. You're wise, people. You know this. That's very true. 
So what you do, you don't give it a whole bunch, you give it a little bit all the time, a little bit all the time, a little bit all the time, a little bit all the time. Pretty soon it starts fattening up, like your ancestors' bones starts fattening up and they start liking you again. And then they start seeing you for who you are because until you give a gift, no one can see you. Until you've given a gift, no one can give you a gift because there's no place to put it. Because you fatten up as you fatten. You become bigger as you make something bigger. So you give the gift, it gets big, you get big, and then it can see where to give the gift. And then you have a relationship going. And then you can dance with it, and then it becomes your happy friend instead of your adversary. Now only slowly, little by little. And so the men that have the courage, this is to what Robert Moore, I think, is talking about a warrior, if I understand it correctly. Maybe I don't, but this is what I understand it. It's the men and the women, men in this case, who have the courage to go slowly, not quick, like, okay, well, I will go do this ritual, and then I'm fine, I don't have to worry about it. No, every day of the rest of your life, and not for you, for those that come later. Because if you do that not for you, then you will grow. You will become it. Until the unblessed are the ones that are doing all the blessing, then you ain't got culture. All you guys, you know, a pile of pups. So... That's the whole thing. The man that has the courage to give the gift, to give the gift, little increments without a huge write-up in the newspaper. <laughs> and if they get one, don't be seduced by it. That would be your worst enemy. Robert Bly, John Lee, Robert Moore, myself to some extent, Meladoma Somme, Michael Mead, we're always trying to be eaten. And the more recognition we get, the more dangerous it becomes for our lives and our personal and our families. That's one of the reasons I come, is to keep protection for these men. Because the worst thing can happen is if you get written up for it. The recognition you want is in your village. You don't need no damn headline. You know, the spirit sees you and then you're happy. Hey, I'm together with my guys. Yeah. Look at the young man. Yeah. You give little gift, little gift, little gift, little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit. Slowly it fattens the spirit and then you start getting the dance. And then it comes back to be the friend and then we got life. Oh, well, maybe I'm getting carried away. I'm starting to talk like a Mayan in English. Uh, <laughs> sort of a Jesse Jackson Mayan. You, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I want to say just one more little thing.